things we're doing. Nice to see some new faces and some different faces here on a, an evening or wherever it is, whatever your time. So we are using Google Meet, which if you haven't worked out already, has got a um, little chat option up at the top. You can, should be able to see there's already nine messages in there. So it's, it sticks out all Sarah's on the early start again. Well done, Sarah. You, you get a, a salute. Um, there I was up at that time this morning to do a nappy change, but that it wasn't mine. But that was that's all good. And um, if you can just drop into the um, notes box where you are currently, it'd be great to sort of have. It just gives us a quite an idea of where people are coming from or where people are joining us from. And, you know, crazy folks doing it at six o'clock in the morning. Whereas the Swiss contingent's quite well represented this afternoon or this evening. Uh, cool. Poland. <laughs> well, we're getting a good mix. Excellent. Um, right. Okay. So we're going to go for a, a similar sort of um, model as we went for last time. I'm going to sort of share some stuff that I'm working on at the minute and, and enjoying using. Matt's going to do the same, sort of initially focusing on our own sort of projects and stuff. Then we're going to share some things that we are currently found useful um, and sort of some heads up of, yeah, there's lots of things and webinars and all sorts of offerings being made at the minute. And we're going to try to sort of share some of those. And then the idea is um, at the end or in the second half, we're going to have a bit more of a detailed look at infographics and sort of the requirements that brings for the, um, the requirements that brings for the, for the IBDP Geography course, and Matt's also going to answer a question that I think Kylie put, uh, put into the spreadsheet the other day about themes and things. If you're looking at IGCSE or something like that, going into the IB, because I'm guessing lots of people have got year 12 classes at the minute with not a lot to do, and everybody's thinking how to keep those busy in preparation for the end of the year and everything like that. So that is the general plan. Please, if you've got any questions or you think we're talking rubbish or you want to say something, please either drop a comment question into the chat and I'll see if we can answer that as we go along or wave your hands profusely and we'll sort of, we're, yeah, we're happy to take questions and do everything we can to sort of try to make this as, as together -y as possible. So let me sort of make, I'll, I'll make a start. Let me just present my screen. Give me a sec. Um, So just to sort of start off with what I've been working on at the minute, um, when I teach using geography all the way, it's always been designed for me to be in the classroom and sort of using it on an interactive whiteboard or something like that. It was never actually really designed for remote learning in any way. Um, though some of the pages just naturally have been designed so that you know it's fallen into more into that sort of way, or some of the pages are definitely easier to convert into that sort of thing. So what I've been doing as I've been teaching since we left school on March the 17th, I've been trying to turn some of the pages that as I'm using them with my own classes into ones that work better for remote learning. So I've been making sure there's more um, sort of structure to them, everything works properly. Now, I realize this is only useful if you are currently teaching the same things as me. But if you are flashing your way through unit one at the minute or unit four, there, you know, the geography all the way lessons associated with a lot of that have been tightened up in what to work with my students. They might not work with yours and all that sort of stuff. But that's one thing that I've been spending too much time doing at the minute in this French lockdown when this, you can't leave the house without a signed piece of paper to say where you're going. So that's the first thing. The second thing I've been working quite a bit on recently, or I've found again in terms of something that's really useful is Flipboard. Now, anybody that's come along to one of my workshops before has heard me banging on about Flipboard. But I do think as a way of curating um, content of which there is a huge amount out there, these, the use of Flipboard is just massively, massively useful. Um, the whole idea being that you create your own um, magazine for your student by, students by 
throwing in content and that can be articles it works really well with youtube clips and things like that um and what we've already got set up and has been set up for probably like four or five years now are a magazine for each of the sections of the ib course and we there is people out there other ib geography teachers other than the um and some of them are here who regularly throw things into those into those magazines so rather than sending your students off to read the news or look at something about this what you have is an already sort of set of resources which are curated by geography teachers so that the content is a little bit more geography focused um ronan who's who's on the call puts in a lot of content that's super useful so does charlotte from belgium you know we're also if you are a big flipboarder or you love a bit of flipboard and you would like to get involved in contributing to those please just drop me an email and I'll find, you know, I'll get you added into the groups, the teams. That, that's good. I have been, um, I've been trying to work a little bit on a, um, a new magazine within there, which is a geography of COVID-19, just trying to highlight some of the more geographically focused articles in the news about COVID and ones that sort of tie in with the bits and bats that we, we are teaching as part of yeah, the various courses we that we do so that people might find that useful people might want to take those those articles from there and flip it into their own magazines for their own students that's what works really nice with flipboard so that's what i've been playing a bit uh, and i'll hand over to matt to say what he's been up to thanks rich uh sound all good from at this end yeah okay perfect um, yeah, just to sort of reiterate what Rich says, the, the Flipboard is brilliant. Most of you are really big hitters on the uh, on the Facebook page. Um, the problem with Facebook is there is no way of categorizing uh, interesting posts. It's kind of uh, just this sort of Tourette, if you like, of people posting interesting stuff and then using the search option to go back through. So the Flipboard stuff is is brilliant, I think, for doing that. It's uh, it's a great way of trying to rationalize all this information that, uh, that that comes our way on an hourly basis actually um yeah this week um two things i've been looking at really in terms of resourcing one is we've just had our timetable for teaching our grade uh, 10s or year 11s as you might call them who are now coming back into school and um, you know that i know that they don't know that yet uh, but they're going to be invited back in to uh, do a I'm going to call it a pre-IB course, but we're not allowed to call it a pre-IB course because there can be no mention of IB or any kind of teaching. Um, but what I'm going to use, as I said last week, is Paul's fantastic work, Paul, who's with us from Brazil, um, and his booklet, and we're going to be kicking off with that um, next week. And they're in for six weeks up until the sort of end of the first week of June. So I've just been planning what's going on with that and i've got a few extra bits and pieces to resource they won't be ready this week but i will post them up on the resources uh, and run them past paul so we can have a look at them to go side by side with the booklet that he's produced if you weren't here last week and haven't seen paul's booklet it is hyperlinked <coughs> excuse me it's hyperlinked uh from the uh, last session uh, on the resources page that we put together uh, and I'm sure Rich or I will put a link up to that in just a second. The second thing I've been doing is uh, just present now. Sorry, there we go. Is uh, chipping away at uh, pretend geography. Uh, so that's leisure, sport, and tourism. And um, I've been sort of putting together, finishing off unit two. So tourism and sport at the local and national scale and just about finish unit three, which is tourism and sport at the international scale. So two's kind of gone okay. I've quite quite enjoyed doing it really. It's um, quite quite refreshing after after two years of doing option G and urban. Um, some decent stuff in there on uh, tourism hotspots and I've decided I'm gonna use uh, Venice for urban because there's plenty of stuff in there, particularly the issues caused by uh, the uh, cruise tourism all at the moment i don't think that's a problem uh, and then machu picchu which i always quite enjoy doing i did cover that on the old spec um, and it's on the bucket list of most students and most people to go to 
and there's some really interesting developments there in terms of them trying to limit tourism numbers and it hits all the uh, hits all the boxes nicely um sports league i've stuck with france uh, it's one of the worst uh, leagues uh, <laughs> in the world, but they have two dominant clubs which kind of work nicely for the whole sphere of influence and splitting France into a, a north and south. And then I kind of went on a bit of a, a trip down memory lane and I've, I've put some stuff together on Glastonbury um, as the music festival and the impacts and there's some quite nice mapping tasks in there uh, using Google Maps and some great satellite images that were taken mid-festival. Um, I went there once in 90. 1994 or 1995 I can't remember um, so it's a long time ago and I can't remember or maybe it was something to do with the beer I don't know um, but it's been been quite good to go back in and in particular to look at some of these sort of sustainability schemes that, that Glastonbury runs it's fantastic um, and so it's kind of ready-made case study material all the way through so that unit's finished and that's free on the website I, I, I'm not going to put it behind a paywall till I've actually taught it uh refined it and made any changes i think i need to make to it and then unit three uh, tourism at the international scale uh again i've kind of come to a, a realization that um iceland <laughs> hits most of this unit um unusually uh, it works really well as niche tourism and a niche strategy um it works really well for the adventure tourism movie location tourism and heritage tourism as well so uh, after the training course that Rich and I were part of last year that I know some of you here came on, we learned about uh, Justin Bieber and him using uh, a very, very famous uh, valley uh, for one of his videos, which has now got something like 450 million views on YouTube and had a lot of, I don't know what they call Belieberers or something, Justin Bieber fans. Um, but we kind of put all that in there, Star Wars have used it, and then Heritage Tourism, most of you will know about Elves and Iceland. And then a good old bit of EasyJet and Ryanair, uh, which links in quite nicely to Reykjavik Airport. Um, and then a bit further down, the one thing I wasn't expecting, but seems to fit really well, is uh, using uh, Iceland again as, tour as a strategy for national development. And that comes about really because of the financial collapse in 2008. The government essentially dissolving and then having to start back from step one also interesting links in with the the uh, the famous eruption in 2010 giving iceland loads of free publicity and then the absolute explosion in tourism um, and i've kind of delved in a little bit some of you might know paul berry he's a recently retired head of geography from devon in the uk and he runs a an excellent an excellent blog spot and he's sort of talks a lot about the Butler model, which I'm going to use for my IA, hopefully this year. But something I haven't seen for a long time, this Doxy's ir Irritation Index, or the Iridex as well. So I've been sort of putting quite a lot of work together with that, and that works incredibly well for, for Iceland and will work very well for Barcelona, where I'm going to go and do my, my IA a little bit later on. So that second unit is mostly done. And... Uh, yeah, any feedback that anyone that's got that, it, like me, does option E. So that's uh, cheating stroke easy geography, uh, as Rich Alloway would, would say. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd appreciate that um, for sure. Um, so, yeah, it's been pretty much sorting out grades uh, 10 or year 11 and chipping away at uh, IB and option E, which is almost finished. Rich, over to you. Don't forget to put your microphone on, Rich. Yeah, uh, the next bit is things that we've been finding useful. Okay, bits and bats out there which we've come across, stumbled across over the last few weeks, which are sort of going to make a difference to what we're doing and we think would be worth sharing. So the first thing I'm sharing here is a Kiolo, which someone mentioned three weeks ago in the uh, in the webinar, and I'd, someone sent me something at school and. You know, it is when you've heard it from a couple of people, suddenly so you're like, ah, this is good. So what they describe themselves, I can't remember what they, there was a, it was a nice little, um, let's just find it, a nice little description of their job is a, uh, it's an argument mapping and debate site. I quite like that as, a, as an idea of what that might be. Um, and what it is, is it's a, 
It's an ability to have a thesis statement and on the computers or digitally have a platform upon which you can put um, claims for and against. Now, I used it last week with my departing year 13s in their final week of um, the course. And we got on really well. We, we learned a lot in terms of how it works. So you start with a thesis statement, and then the students, or whoever you want to, then goes in and puts claims. Now, these claims have got to be short. There should, ideally, there should be a sentence or two. And the whole idea is they work with having, and I've really been pushing my students, that they need to have a data point in there, or they need to have a, a fact or a country, or you know, something like, in the same way that you would want your students to do if they were working or writing their exam answers, you want them to have sort of strong points. This works in that way. Um, and what it does is the students can post a uh, poster claim. And actually, what you could start to see as well is if you click up on the top map, you can then put claims upon the claims. You can challenge claims, which gives it this really nice structure. You can also vote upon claims in terms of how powerful you think they are. So you've got these strength indicators, which would be a really nice way of reviewing a piece of or a discussion later on. And as a teacher, you can also go in and the claims which are made, you can challenge. So there's a, like a whole set of things. You can challenge it, i.e. it's not supported, or it's, it's on the wrong side of the argument, or it's inappropriate, all these sorts of stuff. So you can do that. And you can actually see how the students edit it as they go along. Now, what I'm seeing is something that's going to be really useful here for looking at some of the 16 mark questions. Um, and I think that's going to, yeah, 16 mark questions within paper three. But also, because it's digital and it's here, you can go back to it. So it's almost, see, I'm sort of envisaging these being built up as the argument goes along. And also, this idea that it doesn't just have to be your students. Maybe partnering up with a couple of schools or, or other schools or colleagues that you work with to get multiple classes working on one of these. It always sort of ups the ante when you get somebody in there posting some really good stuff. It might drag your students up a little bit or show them what the competition is like out there. And I just think it's got super, super chances. What is this you are using for these poster claims? Looks amazing, but missed the name of it, yeah. And they have a, like a, a, a public version, but they also have an education version. It's free and it is remarkably easy to sign up your students. If you can, if you can generate a list of student emails, you can just pop it in there and each of them will get an invite in. So, and then you, know, you can make teams. It definitely wasn't too highbrow for doing that. So what I did last week is I just put, I had these three lessons about geography of, of COVID, each with a claim and each of them, which one were I just talking about? I provided the students with um, something, something they could choose. I mean, they had like basically part of the lesson was half an hour, go get yourself a cup of tea and on this web page, either watch something or look at the visualizations or I tried to pick them on from all different sort of places or you can read something or you can listen to something. The whole idea was there's lots to get them going. And while they were reading that or looking at that, they had to come up with a claim. So the idea of sort of roughing it out. Then we shared some of the claims and we sort of modeled some good ones and then we got on to sort of posting them. And the idea is I might try to uh, bring another, you know, another class into it to sort of add to it at a later point. And they're all embeddable onto if you use, like you've got your own website going or a, a class thing or a, learn, you know, a le learning management system, they can all be embedded onto there. So I, I did think that, I think that's got huge potential. It seems quite robust. They seem to be updating it very often. So there's a, I'm not quite sure what their money making model is in terms of being able to stay around but I definitely feel like it's got potential and is worth 20 minutes of your time to have a look at and kick the wheels off to see if it can be used with your students. Um, so that's what I've, I've been finding useful. Over to you, young Matthew. Okay, that was fast. You caught me out there a little bit. Uh, okay, uh, so what I've been doing in the last, well, the last week or the last 10 days, there was the uh, GA, uh, annual conference which this year was done um, electronically 
Um, and so apart from a few sessions on there, one thing that I did do last week uh, was attended a really, really good online webinar with a uh, fellow geography teacher who teaches in London called uh, Kate Stockings. And uh, the webinar was recorded and I'll put the link uh, in the chat facility uh, after I finish speaking. And I'll also post it on the website um, this evening. But essentially, one thing that I've been looking at at the moment is, and it sort of links in with, with IB to, to a greater extent, is that we're not an MYP school. So we do um, grade six to eight or year seven to nine. Um, and that's a curriculum that I can design myself and I'm under no constraints. The head teacher or the school just say, make sure you're building the skills necessary and the knowledge and understanding to link up to IGCSE, but ultimately to, to, to link to IB. So I like to use the IB to, to, to work towards. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about IGCSE later and why that's not my kind of overall goal. Um, and so one thing I'm trying to do is rationalise what I'm doing um, at what you might call key stage three in the United Kingdom. And um, I've been really interested because um, initially um, you've probably heard of Alan and Alan's amazing living geography blog spot. And I think I might have even caught him logging on before. So he's probably only here to hear his name. And then when I finish speaking about him, he'll hang up. I'm joking. He's, he's, he's brilliant. Um, but one thing he, he's done for me as well is that he's he sent through his rather amazing uh, year seven and eight specification, which to a larger extent, I want to do something. I want to try and replicate that. Um, and there's a load of stuff that he's sort of given me inspiration for. And my sort of second area I wanted to look at was 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 what Kate had to say, because she's she's produced some really amazing uh, curricular materials and it's had pretty amazing results. Um, if you get a spare 50 minutes, do have a listen to her presentation. She's very very good at what she does um, it's massively clear that she reads hugely not only around the teaching of geography but education more wide widely and she's got some fantastic observations to make I mean she was being sort of bombarded with questions right left and center and had really well thought out and and some superb responses and gave me some stuff really to think about um, as I'm not only planning what I do at, um, at grade six to grade eight but also the way I approach IGCSE and then the way I approach IBDP as well. Um, I've just sort of stopped the video on the section where she recommends um, some books that you uh, should look at. And again, throughout that, she, she makes really good literary recommendations and talks about books in particular, things like Prisoners of Geography, Factfulness, uh, those sorts of texts which really should underpin uh, what we do um, to a larger extent, certainly at, certainly at IB level. So that was a brilliant um, that was a brilliant webinar to to attend. Um, and again, if you get a chance to watch that, um, please do. Um, other things that I found reasonably or very useful uh, is that you've probably seen uh, these things. Uh, so, Rich, am I sh am I sharing my screen still? Not sharing my screen. Okay. Uh, so. Just very quickly, I should have been sharing my screen. Sorry, people, that was a bit of a bit of a mistake. So that's uh, that's Alan's blog spot that I was hoping that I was showing you before, but clearly didn't. Um, his scheme of work, which is absolutely outstanding, which I'm going to be using uh, to inform mine, and uh, the video is this one here on YouTube, which I will post a link to shortly afterwards apologies for not having shared that um, the second thing which came through just a couple of days ago is this ellen MacArthur foundation circular economy webinars for 13 to 18 year olds um, we've studied that already um, with grade 11 or year 12 um, it sort of makes a passing appearance in our curriculum but of course as you know you could refer to it over and over again and embed it in many different parts of the course um, it's something I think my students still find difficult to grab the concept of in terms of a successful example of circular economy in action. And one thing I've looked for a lot is a successful school project that can be run fairly straightforwardly at, at not massive cost that a school has successfully implemented that has those circular economy 
uh, facets. And I did search, found one example of a school in, in Southeast Asia, but the equipment they were using was tens of thousands of dollars and that was a no starter. Um, but again, I'm going to recommend that my grade 11s uh, tune into this, sign up to it and take part in it. And I'm also going to recommend that my uh, grade 10s or my year 11s, the GCSE group who are not going to be taking their exams, also sign up to it. So when they actually start the course next year, they have a much more thorough understanding of the concept than I can deliver in the sort of three or four lessons that, that I dedicate to it. So again, I'll put the I'll put the web link for the for the students to sign up. Um, and the the last thing is you'll have seen this, I guess. Um, this is Karen's uh, GA um, presentation that's going on tomorrow at 4 p.m. UK time. So it might be OK for some of you guys, maybe not for some others. Um, and this is the really, really good session that she she did due to popular demand. It's actually changed uh, in terms of where it's going to be broadcast. It's not on Adobe anymore. It's going to be broadcast live on YouTube. And so you'll get the link. Rich posted it earlier on, on Facebook. Um, and it's all about the 10 years later, looking back at the impact, the less obvious impacts, things like the increase in farming, increase in tourism uh, and things like impacts on people's health as well, which clearly has wider links within the, the IBDP curriculum. So um, a free uh, webinar with a very, very experienced teacher and presenter if you if you are around and you can tune in at, at 4 p.m uk time tomorrow and um, that would be great unfortunately that hits right in the middle of my secondary staff meeting so i think i might have both things on two separate computers and just listen to the most interesting which is definitely going to be this webinar um so yeah they're the kind of three things really the, the youtube video uh, kate stockings uh, training circular economy for the students and then this webinar tomorrow uh, with Karen, uh, all looking back at the, the 10 year anniversary of the uh, Icelandic eruption. I'm going to avoid saying the name of it. Rich, over to you. OK, remember to put my uh, microphone on this time, which is points, points and prizes on that sort of thing. So the main sort of theme we tried to pick up for this, this webinar was to look at infographics. So what I'm just sharing a view of now, and actually I have to drop the link at the same time into the chat, um, I guess I am presenting, is um, the page of infographic re uh, resources that have been building up on, on Geography of Life. It's free, it's completely open access. So um, just sort of, I'll just go chat you through some of the bits and bats, which is useful that I found there, and then I'll sort of uh, go and talk about a little bit more about the six mark questions. So we all know that if you're an IBDP geography teacher in an exam in paper two, section B, there is 10 marks worth of um, 10 marks worth of exam questions, all based on an infographic. And um, the IB thought themselves very new and funky when they were bringing this in. And I quite like it. I quite like the idea of infographics and things like that. So there's plenty to be done with them. So. What I've put on the website is the top, my top sort of seven sources of different infographics. Visual Capitalist really recently is really, yeah, it's been around for a while, but it's really been knocking it out of the park with some really good um, infographics, really up to date, really using sort of lots of the new stuff, really worth having a look at. And the second one is also super useful depending on whatever you are teaching as part of the course. On the environmental side, this is from the UN environment, part of the UN environment sort of division. And basically on this website, you can find all the graphics and diagrams which have been in UN um, environment, um, what is the word I'm looking for, publications. And they're all being pulled out. So if we just jump into this one here, you should be able to see that. You've got all sorts of little ones there. And if you go to search, if I search Arctic, for example, if you are teaching um, extreme environments like everybody should do, um, come on. Search, why aren't you searching? You were searching earlier today. Okay, maybe it's not, or maybe it's just being slow. Um, okay, there you go. And then you'll get another option up here to look at all the graphics associated with it. You've got all sorts of things here from maps of invasive um, 
pathways into the Arctic, so that'd be useful for where does invasive species along shipping routes come? Where's that? That's in Unit 6, Unit 5, Unit 6. You've got Arctic population development. You've got things looking at marine things. If you type in glass, there's a nice little feedback diagram about climate there. So there's all sorts of things. So that is a super site to be looking at and to find some really high quality um, resources. Some of the other ones are quite sort of more than usual ones. The uh, Economist has a blog, basically a blog where they share, a, every day they share a graph of some description. That's really good. Some of them are appropriate to the course or the geography we teach, some of them aren't. Um, Information is Beautiful is the original sort of source of infographics. They, at the minute, have a really good Instagram feed where every day they release a, like a mini infographic they are nearly all appropriate to what we are doing and there's lots of different styles so just using one of those as a lesson starter in terms of what you think you know what you like about this even if it's not useful for the infographics it's part of your geographical skills that you need to cover and um, the world bank is good there um so there's some other ones to look at there i also put together some or put in one place some articles about infographics and um What is, you know, the, it's a quite an interesting one from The Economist um, talking about, um, yeah, the mistakes they have drawn and all that sort of stuff. And a useful one that Paul sent me towards The Guardian's 16 useless infographics, which is also makes quite a good starter. This um, graphic, I suppose it is, um, if you can get this printed out big or use this for your students, this is really good. It comes from the Financial Times and it's what they call their vi visual vocabulary. This is super good in terms of the language of talking about graphs and things. Again, a lot of these things have got uses for targeting our students at those 10 marks during the exams, but they've also got applications for students working across their IAs, like from the essays, all that sort of thing. Um, now, because section B, paper two, is only really for global change, um, it's only really appropriate to units one, two, or three, but I still feel that you should be using um, infographics throughout the whole course. So what I've put, I just did this this morning, there's one, one to get you going, infographic from each of the sections of the course, plus the optional themes that I teach of freshwater, food and health, and extreme, no leisure sport and tourism that will be done around here, I'll have you know more because of the head of department than myself um, and then there's a couple of exams that i had to go at writing before the days where we had the three that we have currently so you've got those to have a look at so that's there it's all free it's if you anybody's got any suggestions or stuff to add to it please please do uh, give me a shout but what i'm going to try and do is stop sharing that and instead i'm going oh everything's going wrong i'm going to share a tab i'm going to share this one okay so it should be working now so i've i'm got here i just sort of put through some slides together this morning that i thought might be useful um some of it we all know but there, you know, there's plenty of infographics out there and we should be using them all the time. So it's the idea that somebody I, you know, has taken a set of geographical data and the designer has had their wicked little way with it. And therefore, they've tried to make it pretty, they've tried to make it bigger, better, larger, smaller, they've tried to skew it in some way. And it, it, we should be linking to that to how our students produce their IAs. I mean, we, we talked to them about the best way to produce a graph and how to change their axes so that is clear and maybe to a, take out that anomaly to make the line. You know, we are in the same way. We are skewing what our students produce to some extent. Infographics aren't too dissimilar. And it is possible at the minute to find them on. on I haven't really gone through and tried to find one on every subsection of the course yet, but I don't think it would be too hard to go and do such a thing. Now, lots of people talk about approaches and how, how they approach these when they're teaching them. I try to keep to you know, things which are relatively simple. We, at our place, we use oh so easy, this idea that when students are describing something, they always need to be looking for something obvious 
something specific and something odd. So as soon as they see a, see a describe command term or something like that, they always should be thinking, oh, so easy. So we work on that a lot. That can help us. Um, but actually, really what we need is someone to put together a website called poorlyproducedinfographics.com. Because actually what we're looking for in the exam is infographics that have been put together in such a way that they do show a skew or an inappropriate color has been chosen or this has been missed out. Actually, a lot of the infographics that we find out there are brilliantly well designed. And unless you go and find one from a sort of a publication with a certain political skew, you're not really going to easily find too many that aren't cut in the musk that aren't really up to spec. And actually, you'll notice that the IB are the ones they're using in the, the exams, they're either making themselves or sticking them together from bits that other pe people are doing or slightly editing ones which are out there. So the one you can see on the screen at the minute, the, the Quetta Power Africa, this is about to be the original one from the specimen. The one in the specimen has actually been edited from this. This was produced by Good, good.is, which is a sort of a website that like, I don't know what sort of website it is, it does this sort of thing anyway. Um, so they are almost sort of stuck, stacking it to help the students by putting something in there that isn't maybe as good as it could be. But that doesn't help us when we're out and about trying to look for infographics that aren't really that good. So there's a 10 marks with this question. I'm not going to worry about the first three or four marks, which are the, just a simple interpretation of what's this, what's that, describe that. Because if they can't do that by this point or the point you've got them ready for the exam, all bets are off. However, the six marks does seem to be at the minute probably the most, one of the more challenging six marks within the exam to get. Um, now, in terms of what we've had already, we've only got three of these questions to be working on. We've got the specimen, we've got May 2019, and we've got November 2019. What will ever happen to the uh, the papers that were never seen in May? God knows, maybe the IB will tell us at some point. It'll probably charge us extensive amounts of money to get them on the CD at some point anyway. But there we go. Um, so we've got evaluate two ways in which Africa is portrayed. To what extent does the infographic offer a flawed representation? And evaluate the strength of the links. So we're looking at AOC command terms, we're looking at high level sort of thinking, and very much it's some sort of evaluation, it's some sort of what you like, what you don't like, what you think's going on here. Now, just, I spent some time today looking through the subject reports. I mean, I must get a life lockdown is really sort of leading me to these crazy behaviors. Um, and what you've got is some quite good advice coming from those. You've got um, this idea, and it, it definitely mentions it, that we should be going or getting our students to go beyond talking about layouts and color selection. It's almost, if that's all they can find, they shouldn't, yeah, we need to go further. And yeah, there you go. There, there's definitely a, a request in there to be looking at the geography represented rather than just the style of the presentation. Your students, need to be talking about the geography. They need to show some understanding of the geography that is going on in the question. So we've had one about energy, we've had one about um, Syrian migration into the US, and we've had, what was what was the November one? I forget what was the question on. Was, uh, oh, so poverty and gender. So there, these are all things that we cover in the course. The students should have some working knowledge of these which they should then also be able to bring into how it, this data has been presented and work with that. These currently looking at subject reports, students aren't automatically engaging with the use of the language they're, they're seeing on infographics. They're looking at the colors used, they're looking at layouts, they're looking at scales and things like that, but they're not looking at the language. And apparently that is missing them some points in certain places. So push your students to look at the language. Um, and also to think about the requirements of a command term. So, for example, in the May 2019 one, it was a to what extent? To what extent doesn't just have to be negative? To what extent can also be positive? So you would be, if you are doing that well, 
you seem to be looking at to what extent has it gone well, to what extent has it not gone well, or whatever element is being looked at. So, you know, definitely working with your students as much as you can on command terms. I know they're not as obvious as they used to be in the um, in the guide, but still, every one of your students' questions that will come across in the exam will be a led with a command term that they need to know what that command term means. So make sure that you are drilling that with your students. And this idea of using all the information on the resource, not going for the biggest, not going for the brightest, all that sort of stuff. Now, okay, this isn't a magic wand for your students suddenly getting sixes, but actually any time that you uh, have a look at infographics with your class, and I do recommend you try and do it regularly, um, rather than having a whole lesson of infographics, I think it's something that should be 15 minutes here and 20 minutes there. Focus on this idea of evaluating it as a as a source. What it it you know what could be good, what could be you know what could be improved, all that sort of stuff. Um, and a couple of people have been asking about how to deal with infographics. And now different classes have different ways, but this is probably the opportunity to be nice to the historians that you work with. They will make jokes to, uh, to you about your use of coloring pencils and you will make jokes about to them about their love of dead people with moustaches but they tend to be working along the lines of origin purpose content value and limitations and your students have probably seen these before in terms of um source analysis especially yes yeah. is that a yes is that is, is this something people recognize anybody out there sort of doing history teaching as well um, so using this sort of thing, I mean, when it comes down to it, an infographic is just a source. So therefore, using these sorts of structures that students have used before, get them thinking about a little bit more in depth, other than the colour and the um, layout, is going to help. Um, there's a little bit more explanation. These slides will be on Geography of the Way and maybe on um, Geography Pods, the two sort of the pages we put together to sort of put all the links together after these. But also just using well, you know, what, why, when, who, and when. It's just a way of getting the kids, the students to pause and think about what they're doing when they're looking at their infographics. Um, that's about all I've got to say on the wonderful world of infographics, which doesn't, yeah. Anybody got anything they want to sort of throw in or any questions? Um, And I think everybody been very quiet and before I said no. And please stop. Right, so over to Matthew. Yeah, thanks, Rich. Now I'll remember to. I've got nothing to share on my screen this time, so don't, don't stress if, if if nothing comes up. Um, yeah, just just to sort of reiterate what Rich said about the infographics. I mean, I try to chuck them in where I can in those those units on population climate change and resources um and obviously as rich said that they're, they're the ones that that's going to be the focus in in the exam on, on in paper two um but i also increasingly have started to use them lower down the school particularly in igcse not only to study but also getting students to create their own infographics using um picture chart for example which is quite nice and You've got a limited number and um, you hand this sort of thing over to kids and they come back with the most amazing things i've in the last two years in particular i've been blown away with with just what some of these students come back with often the the weaker ones that really don't like using too many words or avoid that kind of whole page of writing and they come back with something incredibly visual which is a, a brilliant revision tool and gets them to think a little about a little bit more about the the effectiveness uh, of, of what they're trying to show, where they're getting their data from, and so on and so forth. Um, so I thought I'd just answer a question that's come up more than once. Um, Kylie, who I know is on here today, um, had asked about the most important themes and topics from IGCSE or MYP that students should know before embarking on the IB. Um, I can't answer for MYP because it's not a program that I know. As I say, we design our own grade six to grade eight and then we're constrained sorry we teach um igcse cambridge to grade nine and grade ten um i would say that igcse for those of you that do it is um good preparation 
in terms of being able to work through a lot of work um, to be able to revise. Um, it's not so much depth learning, which is a bit like IB. It's kind of breadth. Um, most of the units that you cover will come up at some point again. Obviously, you know, the big units, if you teach them, are population and settlement. Population, again, comes up in, in, uh, in paper two as one of the first units. And I think I broached on that last time that I don't teach that until right until the end of the course because the students sort of find that the more easy, uh, easier of the topics to understand. And it's still fairly fresh in their mind, even though they did it two, two years and a bit previously. Um, but population settlement obviously links in with option G, which is a bit of a beast, uh, which is the urban environments one. Um, and then after that, you kind of take a bit of a delve into what's called natural environments with IGCSE, which covers tectonics, of course, which links into the D, geophysical, rivers, which is option A, um, coast option B, weather and climate elements of option C. Economic development, I'm not a massive fan, really. It's it's very dated, I think. It, it does have elements of uh, work, knowledge and understanding that ultimately are going to be useful um, in IB. But agricultural systems linking with food and health, global tourism, again, linking in with option E. Energy systems linking in with global change in unit three. Um, but the big issue I find is the format of the exams and the format of the proposed delivery, which is it's box learning. You learn rivers, you learn coasts, you learn population, you learn settlement. But there is no emphasis on synthesis. There's very little in there on sustainability. There would be nothing in there unless I dropped it in as often as I can, anything on the sustainable development goals. Um, I've started to sort of reference the four P's where I can so the students get used to those as key terms. But, you know, each unit is, is, is examined on its own and doesn't require any sort of synthesis. So you kind of got to, I suppose, toe quite a fine line between making those links explicit in class, but also trying to tell the students not actually what they're going to, not actually what they're going to write in their exams. And if they do, they they run the real risk of straying away from the, the mark scheme um, and actually potentially disadvantages them, disadvantaging themselves in some respects. So um, it's something that I regularly, um, I wouldn't say have a go. No, I would say have a go at, uh, at CIE. Um, when I see them in the Geographical Association, uh, they have a little stall there. They have released a new spec uh, two years ago, which isn't new at all. Um, but it urgently needs an overhaul. So I suppose what I'm saying is um, that though if you've got IGCSE students coming through to IB, those sort of first two or three weeks when you have your induction with them are crucial really to sort of switching that box learning to synthesis, place and space, local, national, international, the four Ps, all those sorts of things. Um, and actually, it'd be quite interesting to see the difference this year that this kind of test situation is going to be where we've got grade 10s or year 11s coming back to do this six week course, uh, which is nothing to do with the IB, but it is obviously because it's the, the work the work that Paul's done and see if that actually has makes any difference. Maybe when I'm doing this, the sort of circular economy course as well, that we might see some sort of movement with that as well. Obviously, the paper two, which is the skills paper, that I think is more valuable in terms of map skills. The map skills there are, you know, pretty decent level. Um, and again, paper one, which is the options paper, one of those questions every year will be based around a map. I think I didn't check since this afternoon, Rich, but I think it was option G last year for the May series, which would have been urban environments that, that, that there was a map skills question. Um, and then again, interpretation of photos, interpretation of graphs. Those sorts of things, I don't think, uh, are, I mean, they're, they're good preparation, I think, for what's coming next. It's just the way that we interpret those is, is a little different. So, you know, IGCSE, I think it's all parts of the jigsaw, really. But actually, one thing that the, the IGCSE students quickly learn when they start IBDP is that it's a very different type of geography. The approach is completely different. Um, it's a far more relevant course. And they sort of look back at IG with that kind of, God, I can't believe we had to do that. But anyway, it's been a pathway into getting us to where we need to be. 
Um, and again, you know, I'm, I'm sort of surprised maybe like some of you. I mean, we have to work very hard, I think, as IG teachers to make it relevant. Um, if you get a chance and you're on the Facebook group, have a quick chat with Gemma Archer. Uh, she shared with me after the webinar this morning uh, her planning document, and she's managed to reduce IG to eight case studies in total. <laughs> Mine is somewhere between 30 and 40, um, but she's done a pretty good job on that. And she's chopped the course up and, and, and teaches it. As IB say, we can teach IB in a completely different uh, in, in a completely different uh, structure. So uh, Gemma Archer, if you want to uh, drop her an email, I'm sure would be fairly happy to share with you what she does. But it's it's good, and I think it's something I'm going to have to move towards as well. Um, so yeah. Um, Again, get those infographics in if you can at IGCSE in particular in your population unit and in particular in economic development with resources and climate. And I think that sort of starts to sow those seeds of, of knowledge that Rich was talking about before to get them used to those and critiquing those types of graphics before they get to IB. Five minutes left, Rich. Anything else you want to say? Um, just a, a question that uh, Ronan dropped in there about how much time you spend doing math skills with IB students, especially if you've had students that haven't done um, geography before, you know, or they haven't done it for a long time before you get their hands on them. I must say, personally, I don't do it a lot. I could do it more. I tend, it all sort of depends what... Um, it depends what units you're doing. Uh, I tend to pick them up when, after we've done um, freshwater landforms. I think that's a good opportunity to have a look at them. Um, I tend to use them the lesson before we break up for Christmas and we'll have some math quizzes. But I, it is sort of one of those things on the bottom of the jobs list that I have in terms of integrating them more into, into the site. I mean, for Switzerland, when, when you've got the map topo site, which has got the map layers in it, pulling up locations in there, you're sort of doing map skills, so you're doing symbols and all that sort of stuff. But then you've also got to think about how, how many points worth is there for a map skills in the exam. And actually, the biggest ones come from a question that you might get, such as, I think they're using, using map evidence is the term they tend to use, or using evidence from the map. But it's only ever like a two or three mark question. It's one of these things that as geographers, I'm sure we'd love to do more of. However, when you're balancing up everything else that a DP student needs to do and the time you get in your IB lessons and all that sort of stuff, it, it's just not something we get enough time to do. I hope that sort of answers your question in a sort of a fluffy way. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening. If you didn't do before and you joined us after the start, if you could drop into the chat where you're listening from, it just helps us get an idea of you know where we are, where we are, and where we where we're talking to people from. That would be great. Um, the idea is to try and do one of these every three weeks. So we're going to do this again on uh, Monday, the 18th of May at eight o'clock. However, if you want to do the 11 o'clock in the morning one, we're not doing it on the Monday. We're doing it on the Tuesday. So we're actually going to start with the more European focus, European and six o'clock crazy New Zealand people that get up far too early. And uh, and then we're going to do the, sort of the 11 o'clock one, which is um, on the next day. But we'll advertise it on the Facebook group and on Twitter as we usually do. If you've got any questions or suggestions of things that we should be trying to address or you want to hear us talk about, or you want to come on here and talk about, it definitely does not have to be the me and Matt show by any stretch of imagination. We, uh, you know, other people are more than welcome to talk to. I reckon it might cost us some beer, but we might get a guest guest lecture from uh, Alan Parkinson at some point. I reckon, I reckon that is, yeah, yeah, definitely. It, the nod, the nod says yes. We'll try and get into keep it linked to IB somehow and all that sort of stuff. But thank you very much. Um, You'll find both on my site and Matt's site a page of all the links that were shared through today and other, th other things that people have suggested as they've gone through. Um, but thank you very much. Enjoy your evening. Stay safe. Keep washing your hands. Conserve toilet paper. Be good. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop the recording. Where is it?
Thank you, Rich. Always good.